people going, ask him questions. And usually the like 90% of them are Spider-Man questions. So oh, yeah, yeah. So, well, look, that, that's, <laughs> we'll deal with that. That's definitely your matrix, I think. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh... Um, and introducing our guest, uh, Eddie Chu. Um, Eddie has uh, been around in the industry for 15 years, more than that. I met you f yeah, more. Now it's getting on to yeah. 16 and 17. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been a while. Um, yeah, and you've been working as an animator, senior and lead animator in film, television, commercial, game cinematics. Um, and now you're back sharing your knowledge through the Griffin Academy. Um, uh, yep. And trying yep. to uh, push things out into the uh, into the world, trying to raise that next generation of animators. And uh, yeah, we thought we'd have a nice chat with you about um, your experiences since leaving Perth. Um, and uh, of course, Lindsay, who did um, a fair amount of uh, rooming and uh, working on large production, and you can both uh, chat back and forth about that and discuss the, <laughs> the nuances of uh, growing out of yeah. Perth, which I've never done, but sure. Um, yes. Uh, and uh, and yeah, we'll we'll sort of leap into the questions. And just I've got multiple windows open here, so let's uh, deal with that and the multiple. Yeah, questions. thanks for having me. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks for having me on. By the way. No, 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 no. it's a privilege. It's good. Yes, it's uh, great. Privilege and a pleasure. Yeah. Cool. Um, so. So this is. Just out of curiosity, this is being streamed onto YouTube, or is it separate? Like, uh, it is streamed onto YouTube right now. So, oh, gotcha. Through this live. Zoom conversation. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. So, so I just make sure your door shut and uh, no one's accidentally going to the loo or having a shower in the background or something. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, Children and animals, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. 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 Thanks for the heads up. No problem. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh no. No picking of your nose or or just like hacking coughs or anything like that. I'll try not to do any myself. Yeah. Uh, Make sure you have all your spare change out of your pockets. Yes. Uh, 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 yeah. I just is there going to be a spider ham film? No. See that. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be good. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, we're going to start with the questions and get oh, out yeah. there. It is five past ten. Um, so we'll um, start with our number one question. Where were you trained? How did you get these skills? What was the what was the leaping point for Eddie Chu as an animator? Uh, I guess I was for a lot of years. I was self uh, self taught, uh, but I did start um, with a lot of drawing. Mm -hmm. So I grew up reading a lot of comics like you know Marvel DC comics and then you know I thought I visualized myself as a comic book artist that was my plan that was my goal so I did lots of poses also you know lots of like cover style pin up um, and I think that helped me um, lead into animation because animation is all about strong poses as well um, but at the time obviously I wanted to draw and then that I went to Kern University for um, multimedia uh, design degree, mm -hmm. and then that's where I discovered um, 3D and 3D animation. Before that, I didn't know what it was. I, I kind of knew, you know, I saw cinematics, you know, video games, but I didn't know what that was. Yeah. It's just this kind of short film kind of medium, but I didn't know how to actually find it or ask what that is and then that kind of just led me into being a generalist and then a generalist led me into being an animator in 3d and then for the longest time i was self-taught uh, i did a few online courses um but a lot of it is just you know doing your own short films um just loving what you do so when you love what you do you're gonna do whatever it takes to be good at your craft Mm. Yes. So a lot of that was, yeah, just internet and um, you know, personal shots and things like that. Cool. That's cool. 
Okay, and so your original skill skill set uh, was um, was basically figure drawing, anatomy, um, that kind of thing, um, building up from there. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that creates a good base, uh, especially as an animator, because you rely on um, key poses. So key poses are pretty much like your golden poses, poses that you create your animation around, um, mm. and you want to create like strong silhouettes and you know strong staging. So every pose is clear, like you can freeze on any frame and it's going to tell you exactly what that character is feeling, um, what they're, you know, what they're going to do, where, they, where the energy came from, where it's going to head, um, and it's dynamic and exciting at the same time. Uh, along those lines, did you have a copy of Drawing the Marvel Way? Uh, probably, yeah, I had a bunch of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I actually just copied comic books themselves, yeah. comic book artists. Okay. Yeah. So what do you think what do you think your main influences were early on? Uh, as in which artists or Well, yeah, whatever. Um, a lot of it was Marvel Marvel comics. So I was a fan of uh Joe Matarera. I don't know if you re you guys read comics. The bell. He did um a lot of X Men. He was famous for X Men and then he started doing battle chases later on. Um he's got a very uh, Japanese manga style, but he's combined with like American as well, so it's a combination. Um, so early on, yeah, I used to just copy his stuff all the time. Um, but yeah, a lot of like other comic book artists like Jim Lee and I guess a lot of a lot of Marvel. But yeah, even so just reading, oh sorry, no go on, go. On. I was just gonna say, just reading superhero stuff, superhero comics were. Um, I guess that's, yeah, that's what I loved, reading that genre. What did film and television, or, or say TV animation, or film and TV have as an influence on you? Was that major, or was that primarily starting off with comics and that was the launch pad? Uh, can you say that again, sorry? Oh, sorry. Um, uh, were you, did you have any other influences apart from comics? What, uh, what were the sort I of movies and TV that you were influenced by? And was there anything else for that matter? Gotcha. Um, I was... Uh, what actually got me into um, 3D itself was um, cinematics, game cinematics, first of all, um, and then film after that. But in particular, I think when I discovered it was, um, do you know World of Warcraft? Around that time, Final Fantasy, there was like that could be game cinematics. Like yeah. And like games started having uh, movies. Mm. And for me, that was like mind blowing. I was like, what the hell is this? I want, to, I want to find out more. Mm. So that got me into learning 3D. And then from there, I realized you could actually just branch off into like animation and different departments. If you, you know, if you get into like bigger productions, they want you to specialize. Um, and yeah, I just ran with animation. I loved it. Okay. Cool. And obviously a lot of film as well like Star Wars and things yeah. like that. So, starting 15 years ago, how do you think everything's changed since that time? I mean... I guess... Uh, like like technology-wise, uh, expertise-wise, uh, do you think yeah. the way movies or television or animation was made just a mere, say, 10 or 15 years ago is any different now to where it is? What do you think the rate of change has been? And uh, I guess... How often do you have to train and keep up with it? Yeah, I think um, a lot of it has, in terms of animation, animation is always, it's, it's always been a, um, you know, like a creative art form itself. Like it, like if you go back to two D animation, um, mm -hmm. it relies on the you know the twelve principles, um, and that in itself is is going to hang around. Um, whereas things like what I've seen, like say watching Toy Story one to you know the next Toy Story, the rigs themselves, the actual three D rigs, so that would have changed, which made the job for the animator a lot easier to do things like I think they didn't have in the first one. I don't think they had IK setups for their feet, so you couldn't actually stick the feet. That's what I heard. But the early ones, the early ones. Yeah, like the first one. So you're using FK to do walk cycles, which is 
I don't know, I don't know how they did it, but you know, it's not good and, <laughs> so things like that has um, just helped the animator. But in terms of animation, I think you know you're sticking to things again like posing and the spacing mm -hmm. and timing and you know all the the principles always going to be there. Take okay. note, my students. Twelve principles yeah. from a professional animator. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, look, uh, I mean, I found with my career, every two years, the whole industry seemed to have completely changed. But I came into it in, in the early 90s, so every two years, it seemed like there was a whole new generation of people. Yeah, yeah. That would have been a crazy time. I guess now yeah. they're going into a lot of, like, Unreal Engine and VR stuff mm. as well, um, which I personally don't have any experience with, but I think Unreal Engine is going into some big games, now they're going into filmmaking, right? Yeah, it, it used to be that. Um, well, before E3 became big, it was SIGGRAPH. SIGGRAPH was the big thing. So yeah. it was movies driving a lot of the graphic, I think. Yeah. But it was weird because movies only made up like barely 5 or 10% of the graphics market. Most of it was just things like visualization for mining companies and, and engineers. Oh, yeah. Some of that stuff is so primitive to work with. It makes your head spin. Okay. But it was... All that stuff was driven by the visual arts, even though, you know, it was everything else. Mm -hmm. So, do you feel that things have sort of sort of remained consistent in the last ten years? I mean, I know we've got the Unreal Engine now, which is actually for me as a stop motion animator, it's like, oh my god, it's great! I can set my lights up, and it's like a live act, like a stop motion <laughs> set. I don't have to spend fifteen steps doing anything. Yeah, that's it. But for you as an animator, things like um, motion capture. Mm -hmm. Has that really affected your career? And and some of the other little methods where you see algorithmic or intervention like AI as well, or I've, I've got to do a little bunch of little walk cycles or a bunch of little animations and then a game engine sticks it all together. I don't have much yeah. control over it. There's, a, there's been, you... been a little bit of a back and forth between performance mm. capture artists and, and animators in terms oh. of how much they contribute to that. So has that impacted what you do on any level? Yeah, I think um, it depends on the production and depends on the filmmaker, um, depends on the studio that you work for. Um, someone like, uh, you know, where digital rely heavily on mocap, but then when it comes to a lot of creature animation, there's still a lot of, you know, hand keyed stuff um, that require an animator to just get in there and just animate a, you know, a nice creature fighting another creature. Um, like something you know that's totally made up um, that you can't just capture with Andy Circus, um, but <laughs> he's positioned himself well. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. He's great. I love his work. Um, yeah, so there is. It depends. Um, there's a lot of um, production still, like you know, Spider Verse, which mm. is just it's 3D, but it was animated on twos, so... It's hybrid, so... Yeah, so you're kind of like going backwards, um, you know, in the sense that you're reverting back to what made animation cool, you know, like TV animation, which was done on twos, so... Yeah, so there is like back and forth and depends where it is, depends where you go. Yeah. And that's okay. the fun part, you know? You, get to, mm -hmm. you have a decision, you can, you can go wherever you want. So along those so lines, do you, you, you knew... You knew going into Spider Verse that um, the the post look of the film um, and how how that um, uh, how the animation um, changes were going to um, affect the film at the end. Um, so, are you saying like just stylistically how? Well, yeah. Like, in terms yeah. of in terms of the animation feel and the look, uh, if you're in yeah. it, you, if you go in at knowing that you're animating on twos, obviously mm. that that makes some creative choices on how you deal with sort of action situations. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think they decided that early on, so that helped us kind of, I guess, plan like where you set your keys, the type of poses. Um, we actually animated on ones, but then you have um, tools that help you preview it, I guess, at on twos, mm -hmm. and then from there you can just like um, kind of adjust the poses and the timing to make it work on twos. 
because it is, you know, it is essentially taking out uh, a lot of the frames. Um, mm. So yeah, it is just a matter of like a process as well. Um, but definitely, yeah, it definitely is different to animating on ones and, and then twos. So. Cool. Mm. All right. So, I mean, production process with something like that, I mean, how much, I mean, you're doing the animation and I guess you're getting animated characters to work with, but how much of the art direction and the design were you involved with? Were you just doing the animation as a specialist or was it just kind of more, did you have much input into that sort of thing? Actually, yeah, we did. Um, what, yeah, what I loved about that show was we got to design a lot of uh, the look of our shot, I guess. Um, there was, you know, an animation supervisor to keep everything consistent, but in terms of creating like speed lines and um, uh, flat lines and case yeah. and expressions, like your, and also like the smear frames, you're just, yeah. yeah. So you, you get to really design something that feels nice and then you can present it to. So were you doing a lot of your own layouts or was that all blocked out for you? Um, like, that, like, like here's the storyboard, match that, and then you start off with that, and then off you go. Or did you have a little bit of, was there a little bit of spontaneity involved in that sort of process? So it always usually starts off that way mm -hmm. until, um, and a lot of productions go through this, they, because they you know, spend a lot of time and uh, budget on yeah. layout and previews, but then towards the end, they start to, the show starts to evolve. Um, it becomes it starts to grow, like maybe they're not like the third act. So yeah. a lot of times I'll just change it at the last minute, which requires animators to then do layout and previews to present mm, okay. that to animate. So Interesting. It's very handy to know cameras and mm. to know film language, um, things like that. It's very important. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So yes. uh, one of the questions that came up. Um, popped in from this from the people sending in questions so uh, uh, into the spider verse well critically acclaimed had double the amount of animators than a typical studio um, what were your feelings while you worked on the sh film knowing it has gotten wh what it has gotten to in terms of scale in terms of manpower uh, I guess it doesn't even it, it doesn't really affect us uh, as a as an animator as an artist you um you essentially want to get the job the film out the door on time mm -hmm. so you are really just um, a lot of times focused on your own sequence of shots um mm -hmm. and you're hoping you know the next person sitting beside you is going to do the same and pull their weight and you don't have to take their shot, but so, oh, it's sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So yeah, it was, so were you working like a little production team, like say five or ten people? Or yeah, you pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so it's working with a little team, and then you're, there's a neighbouring team, and then another neighbouring team on the other side, and then the rest of it's this kind of strange fog that you know there's stuff going in the background. Yes. You're yeah. so busy with your little group, you have no idea what it is, and then. Yeah, you ever have much, it's walk into yeah. another part of the building and get startled at what you see? Like, who are these people? What are they doing? Oh, we do yeah, the lighting. It's like, Definitely. <laughs> oh no, we, we we generate all the all the the, the weather effects, or we do all the clothing. It's like, oh. Yeah, you know, you you meet at beer o'clock or in the kitchen yeah. or something, and it's like, oh, what's up? What are you I've doing? I've only been on this job for a, a year and a half, and I've never yeah. seen you before. <laughs> So I used to get that it's occasionally. Yeah, that's uh, it's pretty standard, actually. So, so in terms of uh, large studio animation, um, what's your day to day? So, what what does Eddie to Eddie Chu do on a day in the studio? Uh, I would let's see. You would you'd kind of sign in and you'd grab a coffee because um, that's important, and you would you pretty much work. You know, like 9.30 to 6.30. Um, a lot of times you would, well, I would look at what I had done the night before uh, with fresh eyes. Uh, I don't really like to submit anything before I leave just because 
end of the day, you're exhausted, fatigued. Mm. So I probably made a lot of mistakes. So I'll come in and look at the notes. I left myself, fix it up. And depending on dailies is, you just kind of prepare your shot for the dailies. Um, and you go from there, get your feedback and then just make it, yeah, make your shot better and do it again. So, so how frequent, I mean, I guess you take it, I assume you'd have your morning meetings with the very... Mm -hmm. Draw, Linz, we've lost your audio. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've lost your audio, Linz. <laughs> Lindsay? Yeah. No, he's still talking. Yeah. Lindsay? I think you can hear us. <laughs> we've lost your audio. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <Is he> good? <laughs> uh, technical. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, technical hits there. <laughs> <laughs> Waving frantically. No, no, that's cool. Uh, so, well, what was that? Your daily routine? I guess you'd be starting off the day, yeah. caffeining up, um, mm -hmm. checking what you did yesterday, and then I guess you go through that whole little routine where you're consulting or being briefed by your supervisors on updates and stuff. And then, how often were dailies? Did you work in a production? Um, like yeah. a little production segment where you do say a week or two and then do a series of these things or was it every day? Oh, no, you, you do it every day pretty All much. Right. Yeah, like uh, you'd also be working on up to 10 shots sometimes. Mm -hmm. So you, depending on you know what's coming in and what has to be done first. So you really got to time manage yourself as well. Um, and also you need a kick off for a new shot mm -hmm. and you're wrapping one up. So it's always just like, as you finish one, one comes in. So, um, does your and it, sorry, how does your team dole out that work? So, do you do you have shots just assigned to you, or does is a person? Hey, there's the jumping animation, so we always give that to that person, or you know, this is the 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 emotional pose, so we give it to that person. Yeah. Is the jumping okay. casting? Yeah. <laughs> um, it depends on. Um, I guess the lead and the supervisor as well, if they know you well. Uh, sometimes it's just divvy it up in a team. So a lot of times you, as a team, you get a sequence. Um, I don't know, you might get like a fight scene in a cave or something. And your team has to just work on that itself. And then your lead, um, if you know them well, and they can dish out to whoever has strengths. Um, a lot of times if you request as well, um, you can always you know, get the shot you want. Um, again, I, it depends. I said I have a lot, it depends, but it really does. Well, like, no, it's, it's always it's negotiated. It's negotiated on the day. Yeah, mm -hmm. and some like some teams, uh, some you know, leads and suits, they just give you a shot, you know, there's no, there is no negotiation. Mm -hmm. You just get your 10 shots and you just get it done on time. Cool, cool. interesting. Um, that aspect hasn't changed much. Yeah. Okay, so how, how do you know when your work is up to standard? Uh, I guess um, when it's time to show or when you think it's done, um, I guess you really, for myself, I, okay, I'm going to say it again, it depends, right? So if you're going... <laughs> If you're, going it's a into, context. Yeah. if you're going into blocking, right? Blocking is like a stage. Oh, it, let's start off with layout. Layout is where you're figuring out camera, timing, beats, poses, framing, you know, of your shot. Nothing there has to be polished or cleaned up or perfect, but it has to give the client the information they need to go forward. And also you need to sign off of that layout and that camera before you start animating and blocking your poses and things like that. Because if that keeps changing, the camera keeps changing, um, if the shot keeps getting longer or getting shorter, there's no point really blocking out a shot until that's signed off. Otherwise, it's just a waste of time for yourself. It's back and forth. So, but if you are talking about when your shot is actually finished, polished at the end, um, how do you know? I would say I pretty much have my own checklist of um, if everything's crossed off and it feels good to me as well. Um, a lot of times, 
you know, you, you check your arcs, your spacing, whatever, all that feels great, but it also has to feel good. You have to watch it and it has to feel like right. Mm -hmm. um, if something doesn't feel, you know, natural or nice about it, or then you have to like figure out what it is if it's, if the timing's off, if a pose is off or whatever. But over time, you just kind of learn to not just see a shot, but feel the animation. I hope that right. helps. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's not, very useful. It sums up what most people have said over the years. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a much of... <laughs> True. Yeah, because like yeah, someone, for example, like, if the audience is watching it, an audience, you know, a regular film goer, is not able to break down an animated shot, but they're gonna watch it and be like, "Oh, that didn't feel right." I, I don't know what it, what it was, but it just didn't something feel was right. off color. Yeah, so it doesn't feel right to them. It's our job because we know we do it, you know, for a living. That's our craft. We break it down and we, you know, get in there, dissect it, and make it feel good, feel nice, mm -hmm. and then present it again. Cool. Okay. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 you know, I'm just thinking. Now, so you primarily deal with character animation. Have you ever dealt with visual effects animation? And if you have, what would you say would be the main difference between the two forms? Do you do you see them as two separate forms? It might be an even better question. I visual um, effects animation and character. Actually, animation. all my experiences in visual effects uh, animation. Um, Spider Verse was probably that one and Legends of the Guardians um, back in the day. It was the only two oh. bit of features I worked yeah. on. Uh, the hour one. Yeah. But the rest of my movies I worked on uh, VFX, um, you know, creature stuff and, um, you know, things like at Weta, like Planet of the Apes and Hobbit. Mm. Um, so that stuff I love. Yeah. So doing something like Spider Verse was something different for me, but, you know, I wanted that, that change, that, that challenge as well. Yeah, yeah. You're kind of looking for it as an artist. Okay. So did you find it particularly challenging? Were there any new skills you had to pick up for character animation? Any nuances that never came across before? Um, I think, so going into, from VFX to Spider-Verse, I had to really, Again, focus on things like posing. Uh, that relied a lot on like comic books, mm. you know, Spider Man poses. I'm a big Spider Man fan. Yeah. So that was easy. Yeah. That was fine. <laughs> was more like, um, yeah. It was more like, um, you know, just training myself again to use smear frames and design um, action lines and things like that to, to really make a shot, you know, pop. And like, I'm guessing you've seen the movie, like, there's a certain distinct style to it, right? There's, there's a nice blend of mm. comic book and 2D oh, and 3D, like there's a bunch of stuff in there. And there was a breath of fresh air when it came out. It yeah, exactly. Very strange coming from the Marvel comic universe because they're usually quite the opposite. They're very conservative in just about every aspect of production. And yeah. then suddenly the Spider-Verse pops out and like, holy moly, it's out it there. Came at the right time as well. It did, it did. It, yeah. um, and that, that also plays a big part in, in uh, I guess our careers. Right yeah. time, right place, I think. It's, um, oops, excuse me. No mirror. <coughs> yeah. Missing up my hair here. Yeah. Um, but um, so apart from, I mean, when you're working on something internally, it's very easy to get lost in it, I guess, lost in all the details. How often do you find that once you've sunk all that time and effort and heart and soul into something, and then you finally see it on the big screen in an audience, how often <laughs> do you feel like, oh, <laughs> I thought I was doing this, but apparently I was making that. How often do you find your expectations and your your internal experiences matches what finally pops out at the at the end? Yeah, that's a uh, that's a good question. Um, Something I've always it, it found depends. utterly nerve wracking. Yeah, again, like it, it depends on the production of if it was hell or if it was fun as well. <laughs> <laughs> Because sometimes, like, I didn't even, like, I can't even watch my shot for a while. You know, sometimes it was just, like, it's too associated with, like, I don't know, too many iterations or changes or whatever. But sometimes... You can't see it anymore. Oh, it's full of errors. Yeah. 
you know. Um, but it is very rewarding. Like, you know, I don't want to sound sore or anything, um, but it is definitely nice to see people enjoy your work as well. Um, you know, when people say they love Spider Verse, um, you know, everyone's copying it. Um, it just, you know, all the other movies, like, even I, like, I love watching Planet of the Apes. I thought that was great, and I'm mm. so happy I worked on it. Really enjoyed uh, that, actually. Yeah, yeah it's good. Yeah. They're good updates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They look amazing as well. Mm. Um, things like I worked on Gravity, and oh, really? Yeah, yeah. and I, uh, you know, I'll be honest. I didn't enjoy the process. It was very, very tough. But was it, I think the movie came out. Years, like you were just working on little parts, and you didn't know what it was going to do until it all got put together by someone else. Pretty somewhere. much, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it felt like that while working on it. Um, but in the end, like it was a brilliant movie. When I watched mm. it, I was like, "Holy crap!" You know, I was so lucky to work on it and meet the director and things like that. So, do you find sometimes that when you do, when it all does come together well, you look at your work and the context that it's in, and you think, "How?" Earth, did I do that? Yeah. Did we all do this? Because often, um, one of the experiences we often found, uh, I mean, I work on films like The Matrix and Happy Feet, and they were two quite different experiences, but there was one thing that they did have in common. It's like, shit, how did we do that? Yeah. It seemed yeah. like everyone put their work together, and then what came out was bigger than it. I know. It, the, the sum of its parts was far greater than its components or its or the work that went into it. So on the one hand, you're looking at your individual shots and thinking, oh my God, I can't yeah. believe that got through. And on the other hand, you're thinking, shit, what the hell? So do you find, is that one of the prime motivations of why you get into this thing? Or is it, is it I mean, yeah. in a sense, it's a very indirect perf performance that we're doing here. We, we, we're kind of performing to an audience, but it's so indirect, it's so contrived and so roundabout yeah like if you're if you're able to step back and you know see it from like the client the director's point of view even mm. like the animation supervisor's um perspective like just looking at it as a whole mm. then you then you can better appreciate what you're going through you know why there's changes why there's uh, updates um rather than being stuck just in your one shot, um, you know, and, and a lot of artists get, um, I guess, a little precious about that. Um, but that comes with the experience. You learn to just kind of mm -hmm. detach in a sense and just step back and see it as a whole. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's a filmmaking process. Um, and that's, that's all part of it, mm -hmm. which, which so I appreciate a lot more now. Yeah, so with the, I guess with the Spider-Verse, you're making stuff jump off the screen quite deliberately. But have you ever done work where you've deliberately gone out to make it as invisible and innocuous as possible? So that is, look, I'm just making a thing, <laughs> be it a bit of background or yeah, fixing yeah. a hole in the ceiling or oh, yeah. something as yeah. mundane as that. <laughs> and my whole job is to make sure that no one ever knew I was even here. So how often do you come across that in your animation career? Oh, plenty, yeah. You, yeah. Like earlier on in your career as well, you start off with, mm. I don't know, animating all like small things like, I don't know, leaves or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a lot of times your shots um, don't even make it in a film as well. You can take mm. it to a certain distance <laughs> and then it just doesn't fit, you know, in the edit. Um, so that's just as bad as doing something that's invisible. Yeah. Um, so, but, yeah, so how important do you think of, it is? Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say that's part of just getting your experience and you know getting your foot in the door. And, yeah. Right. So, how important do you think it is for animators to understand how everything fits together? That is, not everything's a glamorous money shot, but I guess ninety percent of it actually is the stuff you don't even realize is there. And I think, uh, do you oh, feel that's yeah. that's something that? gets mentioned a lot in training or yeah, actually, in animation books? Yeah, it I doesn't. I mean, that is a reality. That mm -hmm. is, um, you know, uh, every animator, whatever level you are, there's, there's going to be shots that you just have to do that's not glamorous. Mm -hmm. That's not the money shot. But it's part of the movie, right? And yeah. that's what you sign on to do. I guess it's a bit like uh, people that work in games. They, you know, we have students that always think, oh, yeah, I've got swords and shields. And then the question comes up, oh, well, what about the mugs, jugs, tables, chairs, carpets, 
yeah. coat hangers, the hat overlap or something. The four thousand other items that you have to make to make that world look yeah. vaguely convincing, let alone anything else. And there's 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 yeah, all the way through. Yeah, so, so I don't like listening to things like that. So you're working in animation and VFX. Uh, are you also doing any of the other roles, like lighting or modeling or rigging or any mm. of that? Uh, not so much. Um, when you work on bigger productions, you tend to specialize a lot. Um, I guess in animation, you you kind of branch out into a lot of camera stuff, a lot of previews, a lot of layout. Um, so like I said earlier, it really helps if you understand film language or if you're a fan of film um, that carries over into um, you know knowing how to make a camera interesting make a shot hook up to the next shot um, things like that they all because um, a lot of times you get a note saying you know just make it just make it cool so, <laughs> yeah. so it's like all right well yeah how does a banana dance? Uh, have, yeah, I have, <laughs> have ideas. So, <laughs> hmm. and then you like I I like that though. I like that. Yeah, Just, because I have um, I have an idea of what I think is cool, so I get a chance to play with that and present it. And if hmm. it makes it in, then hey, great. Yeah. I was just thinking, Tanya, it's not unlike how we do wham bang. So Wham True. Bam, if you're familiar with it, is a 48-hour uh, sort of animation jam, like a oh, hour yeah. game jam, where on the Friday night, uh, teams turn up. They get sometimes randomly sorted, sometimes they're an existing team, and they pick some words out of a hat, and the word will be a color, music, and a mood. And you've got 48 hours to make something with those three elements. Yeah, right. And uh, it like actually a, turns out to be a really exercise because suddenly yeah. everyone starts to do yeah. never think of in a million years. Uh, I think there's there's a, it's a, it's a great little competition because I think it does exactly what you are doing here. It's like, oh, the client came back and they wanted to to cry more. And it's like, it's just a picture of a house. How do I make a house cry more without animating it or something? And it's all in your layout and where you put your cameras and mm -hmm. the colors and all that. And you have to kind of, okay, that's what they want to convey. Yeah. And here's the things I'm going to use to work with it. It's like that Apollo 13 thing where they have to kind of build an air scriber out of bits and pieces. And that's pretty much what you do. I, I think that's where the games fo games folk are just, mm. just starting to tap into that. No, cinematics and games yeah. has been big for a yeah. while, but like in-game stuff, people are starting to move the camera around a little bit. Um, and yeah, game, yeah. game players are starting to see a, a more cinematic universe out there rather than just the straight behind the character well, view or whatever uh, it is that right, really I've, I've been hired once or twice to work on a, to work with a game and where it's like oh you you did layouts and movies did you great well here we go and like oh cool get ready for the cameras and setups and then they say here's the camera you stick it on the player's head yeah job done see ya bye it's like <laughs> okay i'll just go off and go into a corner and quietly cry myself to sleep and it's like well oh, geez don't I feel redundant? Like, yeah, oh, yeah. All that years and years and years of training all about for. Uh, but, so that so how often do you come across those sort of situations where you suddenly find you walk into something and then without you knowing it, the whole context of something has changed. This yeah, has happened to me was, many uh, times in my career. Yeah, it, it happens towards uh, a lot of times when there's towards the end of production. Um, mm. Again, when like there's a lot of last minute changes and yeah. suddenly they want. Um, clients want like you know sequences created on the fly so you just really have to like start pumping out shots and yeah <laughs> we forgot that, the fourth yeah. wheel shit <laughs> yeah so yeah that's uh, that's usually where it happens in the beginning it's it's more like just follow the previews and layouts yeah. and things like that so and then as it comes together suddenly people realize they've made a frankenstein's monster and, uh, sorry my uh just gonna let my cat out Oh, that's all right. Oh, good. Oh, good. I'll manage my non -pand uh, my pandemic right. non haircut. I think your uh, your cable <laughs> on your headphones are buzzing a little too, Linz. While you... Oh, are they? Yeah. Hang on. Just we got a little, just a slight buzz. I can hear it in the background, but that just could be me, like, in my. Yeah. Your circuits are starting to fry, yeah, there, Tanya. True. 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 You have to go back to your cyberneticist. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
So yeah. Um, okay. So, so next question. Um, ten ten years down the track, uh, how is an animator working? How do you, how do you think? Ten years time, the the day to day of an animator. What's what's going to be going on there? Oh, that's. <laughs> I guess uh, I'll get my crystal yeah. ball. Yeah. See yeah. into the future, Eddie. <laughs> Speculate wildly, my friend. Yes. Well, it's funny you ask that. Um, I guess with the whole pandemic going on, that's already changing the landscape, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, you know, we're proving that we can work from home. Mm. And I think. That's a mixed bag. Yeah. And, and I think there's going to be a lot more animated. Um, you know, movies and TV shows coming out from uh, remote work. Um, I don't know, maybe, you know, film studios might see that animators are, you know, pretty important as yes. well, um, you know, when it goes into making films going forward. There's, um, a, there's been an uptake of uh, AI driven, driven tools within the industry as well. So are you seeing them starting <laughs> to come through? I've seen a couple of things like it, it's, I guess it's almost like motion capture stuff, but it's more, mm. um, I don't know, say stuff like based on sound, you know, yeah. facial oh, changes based on sound, things like that. Um, yeah, it's still very, I guess, mechanical. You're still going to need like a, a human touch. Um, you still, you know, a lot of shots are going to require a lot of heart, mm. um, you know, which machines can't really replicate. Do you, I mean, one of the best descriptions of AIs I heard came from the gaming world and they all described AIs as bicycles where you pick up this thing and it does something for you and you realize you've been a pedestrian all your life and oh man, I've got a bicycle, I'm still driving it. Yeah. But it makes my life a lot simpler. So with with things like say, uh, what's an example? Oh yeah, 3D rigging, for example, you've got a character with a rig and suddenly you see someone's put all these funky controls in there. So when I put my dinosaur foot down, it splays the toes a little bit. How much of that do you think should be AI? Because I, I, I've, I've seen a few people grumble about the fact that, well, the new Jurassic Park has these fantastic rigs, but it looks a bit, I'm thinking like the animation on the old ones where they had to do everything by hand. It looked a bit, yeah. I don't know, better? What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, genuine? Uh, yeah, sincere yeah. i mean you know so you're getting into that airy oh i want to, i want my house to be happy or my banana to dance or something so how much of that do you think gets in the way because i often find that with with software it does all this amazing stuff but it leads you down the garden path and then abandons you just before you're about to get to the end you still have to go and rip it all yeah, to pieces and start yeah. again it's yeah. nice but, when um visual effects uh are still relying on a lot of practical mm. like blending of you know, like you use a Jurassic Park example, like a foot, you know, hitting yeah. the mud. Um, it's nice when they use like a prop to smash the mud and create yes. the mud to spread. But then, then you animate a dinosaur hitting that mud on top of that. Um, so you're, match, you're matching a real life reference quite directly. And that, yeah. that I think is where your yeah. best visual effects come from. Exactly. It's still that grounded, but sense. fantastic. Well, special, they're still special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, okay. So. So with things like VR, for example, how do you see that sort of thing? Because I must say, I'm kind of, ooh, this sounds really cool, and it looks very exciting, but it's like, oh, God, I'm going to have to go back to bloody grade school again just to get my keep up with it. <clears throat> I actually so, have with VR. Uh, oh, well, we've seen some people do, uh, we, saw a fant we had a Ranimate uh, get-together. Well, you know, I think I Am Mother had a fantastic um thing where some one of the local Perth uh, visual effects guys essentially wrote a VR set layout system where you'd stick the helmet on and you're in the set and you could rearrange stuff and organize your shots and they'd basically build it that way and it was like stepping onto a real set and just waving your arms around and actually positioning stuff as you might have done in an old old Hollywood film yeah, and, yeah. Uh, apart from getting over the fright of working out how it all works it turned out to be a really intuitive way to kind of work. And I was thinking, you know, if you've got a game engine, you've got a set, and you've got characters that have a fair bit of rigging on them and stuff like that, you could essentially go to the Jetsons or go to the Simpsons, walk inside the house and think, right. Yeah. Back out again and pick out. How an animator kind of fits in with that. Um, 
uh, yeah, again, I have no experience with mm. VR, but um, in that scenario, they would they would require an animator, right? To yeah, um, you know, animate. Well, you'd, you'd, or, you'd need a filmmaker and a layout artist and an animator, and all you know, yeah. and, and possibly even some lighting. You might even have a team of people. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. actually, I guess I guess the biggest difference from when I was working full term in the career now is the rise of production software, like things like Shotgun. So how much of your life revolves around those things? Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're pretty handy. I, we use Shotgun, like, Shotgun is pretty standard. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, like, they're, they're useful. I, I'm pretty indifferent, honestly, with so, it. So is, still, is there still a lot of people talking in corridors and arm waving and, and emails playing in all directions? Or is it all done via, mediated via these pieces of software closely? Odds both, like you um, we'll have clients, you know, we talk to them in satellite, we have, we have messenger um, mm. apps where you just talk to uh, different artists, um, you know, in different parts of the building. If you need to reach another department, you just, again, yep. email a message. Um, Sneak a net. <laughs> <laughs> Meet yeah. them in person. Exchange of pheromones, that sort of thing. If they're in the same city. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. amazing what a difference that makes, actually. Yeah. So, well, it's amazing just now, like being able to see um, full rendered shots and things like that coming through uh, um, things like Zoom, Zoom calls and, and people yeah. are able to share entire layouts and stuff like that set up. It can, it's a little bit laggy and, of course, the frame rate drops a little bit, especially from Australia because our internet is, mm. sucks. But, yeah. Oh, we have the world's greatest internet uh, yeah. given yes, to us course. by the world's greatest economic managers. <laughs> when, <laughs> yes. What have I said? But, um, but um, yeah. yeah, okay, so well, we're getting towards the end of the hour. Um, do you have any advice for an up-and-coming Perth animator or anyone coming, uh, you know, what's the, what's, what's the small amount of advice you'd give them stepping out into industry? Uh, I can tell you what I did, but also what I tell <laughs> all my awesome. students is the same thing as well. It, it really is, it comes down to hard work. Um, mm. Yeah, I worked my butt off to get here because um, I'm from Port Hedland. Port Hedland is like oh, wow. red dirt, you know, yeah. work around spin know effects. It. You know it well. So, and I knew wow. that I wanted to get in the film work of the sea. So I had a plan to just keep keep learning, like just pretty much eat up every resource I could. Uh, work on a lot of personal shots. Uh, work on your demo reel. Demo reel is uh, what gets you jobs in, um, mm. in animation. Yeah. And also, while working on your demo reels and your personal shots, just get the experience where you can. You know, I would be getting freelance jobs while working full time on cinematics, commercials, whatever, just to build up my resume, just to get you know, the next uh, shot that looked nicer than the last one and bump one out in my demo reel and just keep trying to get your demo reel, like the quality, just keep trying to... So it's, a, it's an ongoing thing that you're perpetually adding and dropping from, basically. Pretty much, yeah. Adding and removing from, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I still do it now, but you're going to find that... Like you keep doing that and you're going to get a shot or two as you go, which are going to get you jobs for a while. Mm -hmm. um, they're like, I guess, uh, the money shots in the demo reel. So um, even, again, personal shots, you learn so much from doing short films yeah. and working on your own, you know, shots at home or collaborating with other animators. Even like if you can find a mentor to an online course, um, it's so easy now online. You guys have it easy. We uh, <laughs> we didn't have like online schools. Oh God! Look, back in the I day, my career there wasn't anything. I felt like I was on the moon, and it wasn't until I did a <laughs> course yeah. at Swinburne. I spent four and a half years of my life making a silly little Lego film called The Magic Portal in the late eighties, and I wasn't. I spent four and a half years on that whilst doing oh, a regular right. film and TV degree at Curtin yeah. because I figured, oh, film and TV, yeah. I better get a regular job in the film industry, otherwise no one's going to believe an animator and turned out to be the other way around in the end. But mm -hmm. when I finally got to Swinburne, which was a small little 
college in Victoria, which at the time had a very great reputation for animation, I discovered there were seven other students in the room with me. Oh my God, I finally met my own. Yeah, then, for the first <laughs> five years, six, if you include hobbying around, doing the hobbies in high school, it felt like I was the only human on the planet doing this stuff. There was no internet. You couldn't find anything other than the usual dumb cartoons and stuff like that. It was all kids' cartoons like Warner Brothers from the 50s and 60s, you know, smattering of 80s. Um, or it was the movies and there was nothing else. There was no games animation. I mean, yeah. in fact, there were no games pretty much. It was like the Commodore 64 had just arrived. So for me... Wait, can I ask you then what, yeah. what kept you like going and motivated to keep doing that? If you well, thought you were the only one... Do okay, so the, the thing that got me going was I originally started off thinking I was going to be a science fiction writer. And then I realized, oh no, it's actually comics. So my comics that I really got into were, I guess, the 70s Marvel and DC. But it was also 2000 AD was my big influence. Bit punk, oh, yeah. right? So my heroes came from half the British comic scene, uh, like Mike McMahon and, and the whole kind of those guys. Uh, so, and, and I also picked up, because you were finding whatever you can glean from the from the world yeah. suddenly yeah. Discovered, i found myself reading as much old comic stuff like Winsor mckay and yeah. harvey kurtzman and the classic well i guess the golden era you know that crowd as much as i was the new stuff and same with movies you'd come across a movie and it would be something as huge as the seven samurai and no one in my entire school Virtually no one in my entire family and definitely no one in my neighborhood had ever even heard or even conceived of it. So I sit down in a, in a little dark room with this black and white three by four mono scratchy film. I can hardly read the subtitles, it's all crappy scratches. And then suddenly, three hours later, I'm where did that come from? You know, it's just an amazing thing. So it felt like you're, I was on a lunar landscape discovering this stuff. So it felt really quite remote. And then when I finally got to Melbourne and Sydney, oh my God, it's it's everywhere. And it's kind of humdrum by comparison because it was so special and magical. That's what kept me going. I used to hate actually animating, but it was the result at the end that yeah. kept me going for weeks and weeks and weeks and end. And then the result always paid off. And that was what it was, was that performance thing. Like, I really want to get inside that Lego set and see what they think in there. Yeah, and that's what it was, and that's what people responded to, yeah, and yeah. that's what drove me all the time. And then when 3D turned up, it's like, oh great, someone's taken all the drudgery out of stop motion. Well, briefly, and then off it yeah. went from there. It's been progressive steps like that all the way through. Yeah. So how's the uh, animation industry now, film industry in in WA? Uh, it's definitely picking up. Well, um, we're we're pretty. A couple healthy. of movies get yeah. made. Yeah, we're quite healthy. I think. Yeah. In fact, I think. If the state government plays its cards right, I think with the COVID-19 thing, they could actually put them, promote themselves as a safe haven for location filming at the very least. Um, we got the, and, the, the uh, advantage of the isolation that we, we, we've already right. been so dealing you can, with. Um, you, can with shoot, yeah. you can shoot stuff with deserts, you can shoot stuff with forests, you can shoot stuff with coastlines, you can do shoot stuff with all kinds of different things. and. Um, Relatively clean atmosphere, yeah. relatively. Yeah. Um, and so, when I was training people in China, they were, they were always talking about Australia. One of its attributes was, oh yeah, go down there for the clean air, if nothing else. I guess the bushfires really put a dent in that. Um, so uh, uh, we might, I should imagine, apart from COVID, the mm. other thing that really gave us a king hit was actually the bushfires. They yeah, a lot yeah. of damage to us, a lot of damage. And uh, there's a whole bunch, I mean, the arts at the moment federally has just been delegated to, abolished effectively, and it's now part of roadworks. And so there's a whole strata of, I guess you could say, upper management that has absolutely no freaking clue uh, what's about. So that's concerning. And uh, if we're going to hold an economy up, um, that's going to kind of grow out of mining and coal and stuff like that, then we really have to start developing this stuff in a big way. Yeah. Because uh, it's going to, you know, otherwise we're going to be some old 18th century, 19th century colonial outpost that, oh, we ran out of rocks to sell in the quarry. Yeah. <laughs> All this to kind of, why would anyone bother with that? And well, the, no. the, they're saying that the future, future of employment is creative industries from, from this well, point on, really. 
Um, so I'm sure people are looking at AIs anxiously, but yeah, I think you're right. And the thing about AIs is, is that it allows a team of 10 people to pull off the effect of 50 people. Yeah. If you've got a machine that's helping you, or if you've got um, software tools, like say the Unreal Engine that says, well, you could make Iron Man with 5,000 people, or you could have 50 people in a small outfit, and they've got the same access to the same tools and the same expertise and the same output then it's all going to boil down to, well, how good can they express themselves? It doesn't matter that it's a bit racky around the edges, it's how genuine it feels and how sincere it feels. That's really going to make the difference. And so in yeah, spite of all the YouTubes and, and social media stuff, it's going to be that, your own expression, and what you've got to say, which is really going to set the scene for the future. And I think that's where the next big films will come from, it's the next big trends. It's going to be from people being, I guess, sincere and genuine about themselves. So really, when I look at making shots interesting, I don't think, oh, I've got to make my shot interesting. I'm thinking, what am I trying to say? Or rather, what are we trying to say with this film? And what do we want to have that statement say affect an audience, even if I don't know who that audience is going to be or what the circumstances are? Cool. That's how I see it. And I think that's, that's, that's the important. That you can't separate your expressiveness and what you're trying to say with, I guess, your economic activity. Because essentially, uh, your economic activity is a measure of what we're all doing. It's not a thing unto itself, even though a lot of people treat it that way. Sorry, I'm getting a bit philosophical there. Eh? All right, <laughs> but, uh, that's, that's fine. It's... <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> what have I done? Um, okay, so I'll be just, trolled and yeah. just some final quick fire questions and um, um, Oh, yes. And uh, we'll let you plug what you've been going on with at the moment. So um, just oh, yeah. quick fire questions. Coffee or yeah. Coke? You've already answered that one. Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Uh, background music or silence? Uh, music. And then would, it be, would it be, say, Brian Eno or Ian Moss? Shall we say? I'm showing my age here. Wow, oh, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> there is everything. Everything, yeah, everything. 2D or 3D? Oh. Ooh, um, Ooh, that's 3D. A 3D. Cool. Two and a half D? Okay. Um, okay. Um, tablet or paper? Uh, tablet. Mm. Okay. Okay, well, tell us about what you're doing now when, and. Uh, Explain uh, what what Eddie's into. Sure. Um, well, I guess uh, I founded and I teach an online school called Griffin Animation Academy. Um, so we have a YouTube channel. Uh, we have online courses. Um, the courses pretty much yeah, cover what I talked about today, which is mm. um, things like making shots interesting, film language. It's not just about animation. Um, animation is, um, you know, it's important, um, but it's not everything. Now, when you're working in film, you have to understand how to blend um, film and animation together. I think that's where the real skill is, and that's where I try to help animators create those shots and learn that process to put them to the demo reels to find work, mm. which is uh, super important. Your film language. Which yeah. frames your yeah. animation. Yeah, yeah, things like um, just being able to tell a story in an interesting way, in an entertaining and appealing way, um, without you know, a shot feeling like just a student exercise, like a walk cycle. Mm. You can make something super interesting. It doesn't have to be um, just showing you know, weight in, in an animation. Mm. You can show that the character has personality, behavior, thought process. Um, mm. with, you know, a really fun camera. And there's many ways to do it. Yep. Cool. An infinity of ways. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Eddie. Um, you it's know, been great. And it's been taking, great. taking time out of your evening after probably a hard day animating to... Um... <laughs> oh, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> this was fun. Thanks for having me on. No Had problem. a great time. It's it's great. It's been good, and um, you know, it's been fifteen years since we've seen each other. Like at the FTI, oh, right. like ah, like years yeah, ago. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, and it's fun to 
It's nice to hear your yeah, Nazi accent talk about animation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. True, true. Oh, God. I remember. I, I mean, I did my first 15 years in the biz, and I felt like I'd been there forever. And then eventually I had to kind of kind of change careers because of a pacemaker and a heart condition, which was really sucky. Um, but uh, uh, so that's that's why I'm here at the moment, being a tape lecturer and a uh, you know, bit of an odds bod, really. Um, but uh, yeah, I remember my 15 years felt like a lifetime. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't even remember the beginning of it. It was so long ago in the Paleolithic. And, uh, sure. I, yeah. How do you feel about the next 15 years? I guess would be my concluding question. Uh, the next 15 um oh, let's see like i yeah i enjoy working in movies uh and also now i'm focused on building the animation school um, mm. like i feel like i have something to offer and something that's yeah. different to other schools as well yeah, yeah. um and i i like yeah. that i like that your online stuff complements what we teach as well so yeah because and i like the idea that you're in yeah. remembering film language because a lot of that will change your actual animation on a shot by shot basis in quite a profound way yeah uh, and we have a, a student showcase coming out hoping you know in july sometime mm. to want to be able to show everyone what we're doing you know, it's mm. some pretty awesome stuff there's some talented animators out there yeah oh yeah there's a lot of lot of enthusiasm and a lot of yeah. potential uh, skills and talent to develop just need more animators you know to reach out to me from Perth or WA or mm. Australia no one ever does from, from that side of the world oh well yes. maybe that's what animates key mission this year Tanya. just uh, getting people to reach out and connect across the world well mm. that's you know the internet and connecting to other animators is one of those big things that we as animate and animate have been you know trying to push uh, like like Lindsay and you were saying eddie um the the whole thing of isolation isolation for animators mm -hmm. where we're by ourselves we we um don't connect that often individually even mm -hmm. within studios work in small yeah. teams um and it's that that connecting with other people the small amount of competition that we have between each other you know mm -hmm. that that creates new and interesting and exciting things going forward so yeah 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 uh, well, like everyone has linkedin now there's no excuse linkedin is a powerful powerful um website or app mm -hmm. or it's a you know for networking just mm -hmm. use it you know internet use it yes well no excuse it, anymore. it was it was pretty dry when it first came out but as i yeah it's not it's definitely not the social thing of fa Facebook. It's but it is has a purpose for yeah. business and getting yourself out there. So yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. Excellent. Alrighty. Well, thank you very much, Eddie, again. And yeah, it was no thank you, Eddie. It's it's been a very illuminating and informative session. Yes. Been fun. Thank you for the chat. We will kidnap and Shanghai people and send them to you forthwith. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. Well, everyone on YouTube as well. True. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, we're gonna. I'll stop the stream shortly. Um, it should be available available to review if you want to go through and take notes from from any and uh, and come back. Um, it should yeah, be available. Reach out as well. Just feel free to find me on LinkedIn or yeah. yep, yep. email yep. or our website. So. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Um, Go ahead. I'm harmless. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Eddie. Catch you later. Yes.